All right, so this is uh, the section on fundamentals. Uh, try to introduce you to the concepts that are probably, mo that first off, the words that you'll hear repeatedly as we go through the presentation, uh, and what's really kind of the important stuff about how mass spectrometry and mass spectrometers used in proteomics work. Let's see if this is, it's this one. Okay, so every mass spectrometer system uh, has these components in it. We have some sort of a, a means of introducing samples to the instrument called the inlet, and most of the work that you're going to be hearing about over the course of today and tomorrow involves introduction of samples using HPLC. Uh, the samples go in to the ion source whose job in life is to take molecules that are neutral, uncharged analytes in solution and create gas phase ions out of them. Um, that's the job of the ion source. And uh, the reason why this, uh, uh, this line does not extend all the way to the end of the ion source is for a specific reason. Many mass spectrometers, in fact, most in the past, the entire region here was in the high vacuum region. This is very high vacuum. Nowadays, as I'll get to when we introduce electrospray mass spectrometry, which is our go-to technique for proteomics, you'll find out that we actually create the ions at atmospheric pressure, and then they go into the high vacuum region. So post-generation uh, of the ions, we separate the ions by mass and charge, and that's really kind of critical. It's not, this thing doesn't measure molecular weight. It measures mass and charge, and you have to derive the molecular weight from that measurement. Uh, the ions are separated by the mass analyzer based on their mass and charge. The principles of this, I thought, uh, we all thought were kind of, uh, you know, unnecessary for the biology and chemistry communities here at the Broad. If you're interested, there are references at the end of each of our sections, so you can look up the more, more uh, technical details of this. But the, the ions are separated and then detected, and a mass, spectra, mass spectrum is recorded nowadays by uh, a combination of onboard microprocessors on the mass spectrometer and an external uh, data processing environment. So this is uh, uh, mass spectrometry, you know, just in a, uh, I, I refer to it as the dark ages. It's sort of where, where I began my career in mass spectrometry across the street at MIT. This is what they, they looked like, and I'll tell you that underneath the shiny plastic covers that all mass spectrometers have now, there's a lot of this stuff still there. So there's an enormous amount of electronics and other gizmos that have all been compacted now uh, and made to look much prettier. But this is what mass spectrometers used to look like. They had lots of knobs and dials on them. This is what a computer system originally looked like. This was an IBM 1800 mainframe. Uh, and it had uh, literally massive 10 megabyte storage capability. These were disks about this big that you had to physically remove. Of course, all that's now well in the past. This is what. What, do you do with that yellow hand crank? what the yellow hand crank? Oh. <laughs> um, this. Yeah, it's a hand crank. That was for winding film. Yeah, we actually had to record this, some of the stuff on on uh, on film at one point. Uh, okay, this is uh, and please. Uh, this is meant to be informal. If you have questions, raise your hands or speak up so I can know that you've got a question and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to take them. Um, so nowadays, these are uh, the types of instruments that we have in the proteomics facility here at the Broad. Uh, we have, this is an Orbi trap instrument, Q-Exactive. These are, what's important about this is that these are very high performance instruments, meaning very high sensitivity, but also as I'll come to explain the terminology, high mass precision and high resolution instruments. And we, these are used for our discovery or global proteomics experiments. This type of an instrument uh, is a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. These are also very sensitive instruments. They don't have quite the resolution or mass accuracy as these machines have, but they have other positive attributes that you'll hear about uh, when, the, uh, uh, when Hosmic and uh, uh, Sue present on the uh, targeted approaches. So I've already mentioned these uh, tasks that the mass spectrometer has to accomplish. One that I didn't bring up in that original introduction is 
this one, to select and fragment ions of interest to provide structural information, in the case of peptide sequence information, using MSMS. This is referred to as tandem mass spectrometry, hence the MSMS part, and I'll come back and explain what I mean by this in a, in a moment. Um, yeah, I said that already. So I'm going to at least introduce something called matrix-assisted laser desorption. We actually do not have one of these instruments in the proteomics group. Uh, there are MALDI instruments here at the Broad. Uh, they're used, in fact, in the genome sequencing platform. Uh, but, uh, and there's also uh, one recently acquired in the chemistry uh, group here at, here at the Broad. Um, so let me walk you through this. It's not that it's an irrelevant technology. It's actually very relevant. Uh, it's just that our go-to technique always involves coupling to liquid chromatography, and one of the drawbacks of this method is it's not so straightforward to interface to liquid chromatography. So the way this works is, uh, again, inside the high vacuum region of the instrument, uh, there, we apply on a generally a metal plate a thin layer of a liquid matrix, and I'll come back by what I mean by that in a moment. It's basically a small organic acid molecule uh, that's used. Uh, then your sample is dissolved in that matrix and it's allowed to crystallize on the surface. Uh, it's put into the, the vacuum envelope and uh, a laser beam is introduced through an optical port uh, into the instrument and it blasts the surface. And what comes off the surface, um, it, or, or what that, that ionization method, uh, sorry, that, that laser blast does is to cause an ablation of the, an explosion if you will, of the matrix that is on the surface. There is a large amount of energy that is, tr that is put in as a result of the laser blast, and what happens is that protons uh, and other small charge molecules, uh, atoms, are transferred from the matrix to the analyte molecules that are dissolved in that matrix. So energy transfer, protonation of the analyte molecule, uh, and once it's protonated, it's sitting in a very high electrical field, and it can't hang out any longer. It says, I see this field, I'm going to get ripped out and projected down the, the pipe. So mix in matrix, flash the laser, uh, and ionize generally by proton transfer. So these are the types of molecules that uh, one uses in uh, MALDI. Again, they're all small acids. Uh, no more detail is needed there. Uh, laser time of flight instruments, sorry, MALDI time of flight instruments come in two basic flavors. One is the linear system. So after the blast, you form uh, ions, which can, in fact, because of the energy put in, fragment in the process of transmittal down the pipe. But because the, they have the same uh, velocity as the ion from which they originated, they're really not discriminated. So they all arrive at the detector pretty much at the same time. In reflecting instrument, you can, uh, these ions get bent in another electric field, which then does take into account the mass, the difference in mass of the fragment ions that may have formed from this parent, and they then arrive at the final detector with differing times, and you can measure their masses that way. MALDI is, any questions about that? No. Nope. MALDI is particularly good uh, for measuring intact proteins, and this is really where it's made its mark, and I think it's one of the areas where it continues to to really, uh, uh, really outperform other types of instruments. And this is a typical spectrum. This is an immunoglobulin. Uh, you'll see a protonated molecular species, and in many cases, you will get multiple charging. So this is a, 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 a protein which has picked up two protons and is therefore doubly charged, and that species that has three protons is therefore triply charged. We'll come back to this multiple charging phenomenon on electrospray because it is the, one of the characteristics of that technique. Okay, the rest of this is going to be on electrospray methodologies. And the reason, as I alluded to earlier, is that ease of coupling to liquid introduction techniques has made this approach the go-to technique for all biological mass spectrometry, of which proteomics is a subset. So liquid is introduced, and now this is, what, this is the expansion of the critical region. So that liquid is going through a needle, which is, um, in one, one instance, the needle's held at high voltage, 
In other instances, this is at ground and the interface plate here is at high voltage. So the important point is that there, again, is a charge difference between the liquid coming out of the tip and the entrance plate to the mass spectrometer. And what happens is the, the needle is actually very fine and pointed. Um, the charge difference here creates a, uh, what's referred to as a Taylor cone. There's a, a plume of very small droplets that emerges from the, from the tip. Um, and as the droplets travel the distance between the end of the needle and the entrance uh, port to the mass spectrometer, which is a distance of a few millimeters typically, the ions begin to desolvate. They begin to dry. And as they dry, they collapse on themselves. And if you think about these, these particles as having not just single charge in this droplet, but many molecules with lots of charges on them, at some point the droplet can't sustain the charge density any longer. And there's something that's referred to as a coulombic explosion that happens in these particles. Uh, this is all, of course, <coughs> physics hand-waving, but that's uh, what, what, the, what is believed to happen. These particles blow apart and uh, charged analyte molecules are then uh, brought in to the, uh, to the mass spectrometer. Uh, and on the next, any questions about that step? No? So this next slide just illustrates, this is the same uh, uh, thing you saw on the previous slide, just showing you where, uh, where we're talking. Again, just to emphasize this, ions are actually generated at atmospheric pressure, not inside the vacuum chamber. The, those ions already formed get dragged into the, into the mass spectrometer. And uh, in this particular instance, this is a, uh, a tandem mass spectrometer, if you will, where there is a uh, mass separation device, first mass separation device here. There is a collision cell, and we'll come back in terms of what that does in a moment, and a second mass analyzer. Uh, and then a detector, which feeds the uh, collected information to the data system. So here is, uh, uh, and this is not in the handouts, but it will be up on the website. It's a slide I added last night. This is a typical uh, uh, mass spectrum of a very simple peptide mixture. It happens to be for uh, a mixture of uh, uh, various forms of this bioactive peptide, nociceptin. Uh, this is the piece of it that is, goes from residue 1 to residue 11, another piece that goes from residue 1 to residue 6, and another piece that represents the full length. So one of the things that should strike you immediately is, huh, the bigger piece has a lower apparent mass than the longer piece, than the shorter piece here. And that's, again, because the multiple charging phenomena. And we'll come back to that uh, in, in a little bit. But you can clearly see the three uh, precursor species for the three peptides present here. And when I say precursor, what I mean is the intact peptide. Uh, you see these primarily as protonated forms, but you also see occasionally species in which the proton has been exchanged for a sodium or a potassium, or in some cases, ammonia. These are typical processes that happen. Electrospray, uh, as I mentioned, uh, intro oh, let me just go back here. Because one of the things I want to point out, uh, why these particular residues are in red, is because those are the places in the peptide where charging occurs. So if you think about this, this is, uh, uh, we're looking at gas phase protonation. The most obvious places for a proton to get transferred are to uh, basic residues on the peptide. So there is a primary amine at this end of the peptide that gets charged. The side chains of arginine and lysine are obvious places to be charged. Uh, so the peptide that goes from residues one to six, which is this, and ends right here, has only one basic charge on it, which is the amino terminus. Hence, this is, ends up only uh, being observed primarily in a singly charged form, as the M plus H. This peptide um, is, goes from 1 to 11 right here, breaking between the arginine and the lysine. It has two charge sites, the side chain of the arginine and the N terminus. It's observed primarily in the doubly charged state. And this guy, which is 1 through 17, has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 potential charges. Now, interestingly, we only see it in the triply charged state, 
or primarily in the triply charged state. And the reason is, is when you have adjacent charged residues, you tend not to get charge on both. It's the too, much, too high a charge density. Okay, that's uh, how peptides behave. And of course, this extrapolates up to larger molecules, and you can do small proteins pretty easily by electrospray. This is an example uh, for beta uh, casein, which is a phosphoprotein, uh, in which there, in fact, are known uh, 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 amino acid substitutions in the backbone in this mixture, and that's what these different precursors represent. So you'll see there's a big charge envelope here that stretches probably up to 30 charges and down to about eight over this mass range that's being analyzed. Uh, if you blow up one of these charge states, this 14 plus charge state and scale expand it, you'll see these three components. Now, I'm putting these molecular weights on here and the question is, well, how did I get to that? Okay, how do you know what the, the charge is for any one of these species? I'm not gonna spend time going through this in detail now because it's on the slide. But basically, the assumption is that peaks in a, in a multiply charged spectrum from electrospray differ in mass by the charge, a, a unit of a proton. So any gap between here, 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 here is just adding one more proton onto the molecule. So the N here is one. And you can measure the mass to charge of each of these components accurately. That's X2 and X1. And so you can determine the charge by the difference in, ma in uh, uh, mass to charge X1 minus X2. Uh, X2 over that is the charge state. It's not generally come out to be an exact integer, but you round it to the integer. Um, and then you test that integer again by plugging it in as the, as the charge state for each higher charge. And you actually get multiple measurements of the molecular weight that way, and therefore a determination of precision of the molecular mass. You can look through this, and if it's confusing, you can look at this reference, or you can come talk to any one of us afterwards, and we'll explain this in greater detail to you, or more clearly. Okay, talked about molecular, generating molecular species from electrospray. Now, how do we get sequence information? So this is done by a process referred to as collision-induced dissociation. And it really is just that. Precursor ions or parent ions go into this collision cell region. Let me just back up here. It's this thing that I talked about before. It's a discrete region of the mass spectrometer. They, and this region is filled with collision gas. Not high pressure, but much higher pressure than the regions that surround it. So this might be at 0.1 tor, and the regions outside of it might be at 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8 tor. So this is a high pressure region by comparison to the mass analyzer regions to either side of it. Um, the ions are moving at some velocity, and they basically are striking or in, uh, coming into near, near collision, if not real collision, with the gas molecules that are in here. It's typically nitrogen, or argon, sometimes helium, uh, is used as the collision gas. And you generate, generate fragment ions from uh, these charged species. They literally break apart. Uh, so you also get loss of small neutral molecules, typically water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, uh, is readily lost. And then the, both the fragment ions, as well as any residual parent ion, go traveling out the end of the collision cell. So here's that process in a little bit more detail. So this is an MS scan at the top. Let's just focus on that. So in an MS scan, we scan the first mass spectrometer over whatever the desired mass range is. Here it's 350 to 1200. Here the collision cell is effectively off. There's no gas in it or we're doing something else that causes no collisional excitation to occur. Therefore, all of the parent ions, all the precursors that were formed back here in the ionization event pass through, and we scan those out in the second mass spectrometer. And that's what's shown here. This is the mass spectrum. And each one of these species here is a intact peptide ion, either in its singly charged state, doubly charged state, or triply charged state. And here is an MSMS spectrum, okay? In an MSMS spectrum, again, we, we 
have all ions going into the first mass spectrometer, but now we are telling it only pass a certain mass region. So here we're passing the region 834 to 838. So that's what this arrow represents. Now we have gas in this cell, so all of the ions that have mass to charge 834 to 838 at that particular point in time coming off the HPLC column fragment, break apart, and those fragment ions then go into the, mass, into the second mass spectrometer and get scanned out. So effectively, we've taken this ion, because that's the ion that happens to be between 834 and 838 in that region, we've passed it into the collision cell, broken it apart, and scanned out all the ions. And this, without the labels on it, is the MSMS spectrum that, that you obtain. The labels get added on later by data system and or manual interpretation, and Carl Clauser is gonna tell you uh, uh, more about that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So I'm not gonna spend much time on this because Carl has a detailed presentation on, on this, but here is just very simply, this is a representation of the peptide backbone, uh, and protonation, as we said, was the first step. This may not be in your handout. It will be up on the website. So here's the N-terminus, that's a site of protonation. Basic side chain residues like lysine are protonation sites, but interestingly, in the gas phase, and you have to remember this is a gas phase process, certain things that you wouldn't think of as a chemist as being basic are. So amide backbones are actually basic in the gas phase, uh, as are uh, the amide carbonyls. These are sites where uh, proton transfer can readily occur. But the order is generally amino terminus and the side chains tend to be more basic than the, than the backbone with, with some, and histidine, for example, is another uh, residue that's uh, readily charged. Uh, again, Carl's gonna go into a lot more detail on this, but this is what we mean by uh, breaking the backbone. So in general, the primary cleavage that we observe in electrospray is cleavage at, between, of the backbone amide with charge being retained on either the amino terminal end, generating these so-called B ions, uh, or on the C terminal end, generating the so-called Y ion series. And you basically can fragment all the way along this backbone, and Carl's gonna tell you a lot more about that. That's uh, uh, redundant spectrum. Okay, I wanna tell you uh, in a few minutes about three important uh, parameters of the mass spectrometer that we pay a lot of attention to. One is mass accuracy, and this has to do with how accurate is the measurement of the mass that we are making. Second parameter is resolution. This is really about you have uh, species which have nearly the same molecular mass, therefore they're coming out close to one another on the mass to charge scale how well are these peaks gonna be separated from one another? That's what resolution's all about. Sensitivity, um, not gonna to talk too much about that, but clearly it's, the, it's a really critical parameter. Uh, it is really more a function of how we prepare the samples and, how we, and what instrumentation we're using for their analysis. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into in, in the much more detail about this because sensitivity will come up in the course of the, uh, the following talks quite a bit. Okay, but how do we define mass? So uh, going back to your uh, college chemistry course, uh, our definition of mass is based on uh, carbon-12 with this being the reference point. Uh, and by definition, uh, a, the, the international unit of mass, or the Dalton, is defined as 1 12th the mass of a single carbon atom, where carbon is defined as 12.000 ad infinitum. Okay, so that's the starting point. And most elements, including carbon, have more than one stable isotope. Carbon's particularly important because most of the molecules we analyze have a lot of carbon in them. And the natural abundance of carbon's most abundant isotope, C13, is 1.1%. So 1.1% of the carbon atoms on this planet have one additional neutron in them. Now, so why do we care about this? We care about it because if your resolution is high enough, you will in fact see the isotopes uh, of, these, of these molecules in the mass spectrum. And it's actually important to have high enough resolution 
because the higher, this is a little bit of a, maybe an oversimplification, but more resolution gives you a better measurement of the mass. It's not absolutely true, but in a, certainly in a complex mixture, uh, it is true. And most of the time we're analyzing pretty complex mixtures. So here's the, here are the elements that you're probably most concerned about missing from this are phosphorus and sulfur. You can look those up in tables. Uh, but here's the 1.1% of carbon-13. Hydrogen has deuterium as its uh, uh, abundant uh, uh, element, most abundant isotope. You can see it's actually uh, tenfold less abundant than carbon-13 is. Nitrogen-15 has some um, uh, significant uh, uh, abundance, and oxygen-18 has some significant abundance. And these are all stable isotopes of these uh, uh, of these uh, atoms. When you look at a spectrum of a typical peptide, and this one is uh, got, you know, on the order, I think, I don't actually have the, uh, the composition down here, but it's probably got about 60, 70 carbons in it. Um, this first peak, so the monoisotopic mass, what is that? The monoisotopic mass is effectively the accurate mass including the decimal component, so including, you know, in, this, in, in, in carbon, of course, it's the decimal component is 0, 0, 0, but for nitrogen, we take into account the 0, 0, 3, 1. For oxygen, it's not quite 16, it's 15, 9, 9, 4, 9. We do take that into account. So the, the monoisotopic mass is the sum of those accurate masses for the most abundant isotope of each of the elements present. Now, in most cases, those are the lightest isotopes. But there are exceptions, okay? If you have iron, for example, uh, the, 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 in, that, for the, in the case of iron, the most abundant isotope is not the lightest isotope. But for peptides, the lightest isotopes are the most abundant. And therefore, this first peak uh, uh, is generally the monoisotopic. This next peak uh, is the one that has one carbon atom. Well, why, does this, why is this not at 1.1%? Well, because this thing's got 70 carbon atoms in it, so it's 70 times 1.1. And therefore, when you look at an ensemble of molecules, that's how many are likely to have one carbon-13 represented in a large ensemble of molecules. And this is how many, uh, the percentage, a little bit close to 30% that have two carbon-13s in them. Now, what's missing from this is the fact that this species also has nitrogen-15, under it, and oxygen, and this guy's got oxygen 18 underneath it. I haven't shown you that, but they are making contributions. And as these molecules get bigger, those contributions get more and more significant. And we do take those things into account in our measurements. So back to this spectrum I showed you earlier, uh, to this point that we measure mass to charge and not molecular mass directly. So in looking at this peak, the first thing we would look at is what is the spacing in mass between the isotope peaks in this spectrum. So this guy's at 549.1, this guy's at 549.6. There's half a mass unit, half a Dalton difference between these peaks, okay? What does that mean? Well, you can't have half a charge, you can't have, yeah, you can't have half a charge in this, so therefore this thing has to be doubly charged. So it's, this species represents a 2M with two protons, 2H. So its molecular mass is fundamentally twice this, and then uh, take away two, which is 1096.2. Similarly, this guy, if you look at its isotope spacing, is 585.2 to 586.2. That's one Dalton spacing. Uh, therefore, this is singly charged. If you look at the, this guy, the spacing here is 603.2 to 603.5. That's 0.3 of a mass unit. So that means that guy is triply charged, and therefore this represents a 3M plus 3H, 3 plus. So to get to the molecular weight, you take the observed mass, you multiply it by three, and you take off the three protons from it to get to 1806.6. That's how this works. Now, in the bad old days, 
We did all this interpretation by hand. Now, the, mass the, the data analysis software that Carl will describe pretty much does all of this for you without even thinking about it. And that's the problem, okay? I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what's going on behind the curtain because sometimes they, it, it's, it's not done right and you have to realize when it's not being done right. Okay, so that's, that's mass accuracy uh, and isotopes. Uh, this is a little bit about resolution. So again, resolution is the ability to resolve closely spaced peaks. Uh, it has a def the definition that we typically use now. In the old days, we used the 10% valley definition, but now we, we use a, what's known as a 50% full width half max definition. So that is the width of this peak uh, in delta M at the half height of the peak. Uh, and we do this because a lot of times we have a peak in isolation. Uh, there aren't two peaks next to each other like this that we can readily determine the the resolution from. So why is, why is this important? Resolution is also a function of mass. So uh, I drew this up on the blackboard here to illustrate this. So here are two peaks uh, differing by one mass unit uh, at mass 500 and 501. And we have a static resolution of 1,000. The peak widths here are 0.25 of a Dalton as a result of that. And they're very cleanly resolved. You can easily tell that you have two peaks here. Now, as you go up in mass, still retaining, maintaining a resolution of 1,000, we're now at mass 1,000 and 1,001 for these two peaks. They're still separated by one mass unit. Now the peak widths half a mass unit, and the peaks are still separated, but just barely from one another because the width of the peak has increased. Now, once we're up to mass 1,500 to 1,503, this is this region, Again, now we have a peak at mass 1500 and a peak that uh, has a peak top at 1502. Now the width is 0.75, and you're seeing that we're just barely able to tell that there are two peaks. And of course, as you go higher in mass, this gets worse and worse. So here's uh, a slide illustrating the effect of this, uh, showing you the change in resolution at uh, for a, uh, a peptide at mass roughly 1271 and another peptide with a uh, monoisotopic mass of 2536, so roughly double. Um, you notice that if we have a resolution of 500, we really do not resolve any of the isotope peaks at all. Uh, the peak top here, which is the thing that is most easily measured, doesn't represent the monoisotopic mass nor does it represent the average mass. If we used the average masses that combine all the isotopes together uh, into the weight of the, uh, of the atom. But once we get up to a resolution of 1,000, at this mass we are beginning to separate the isotope peaks and we can cleanly determine the monoisotopic mass of uh, the, uh, the accurate mass of this peptide. And at a resolution of 5,000 you've got basically sticks which are even easier to determine. Now, of course, as you, this is just an illustration of this again. As we've now doubled the mass, you can see that at resolution of 1,000, we no longer resolve these peaks, whereas it now requires a resolution of 5,000 in order to get decent resolution of the peaks for a peptide of this mass. So that's two different ways of illustrating the effect of resolution. Any questions about that? So, maybe the most important thing for you to take away from this is that in a complex mixture, you don't get, measure, you don't get accurate measurement of your masses unless you've got decent resolution. So here's an example where uh, this is a low resolution spectrum. In this case, these aren't peptides, these are just small molecules. There are four low, small molecules in a mixture, and on a, an instrument like an ion trap with a resolution of you know, around 1,000, this is what that envelope looks like. It's unresolved, and the best thing you can do is to take a centroid of it, which doesn't give you the molecular mass of any of these species, and obviously doesn't tell you that you've got a mixture present. But if you go to an instrument like our high-resolution Orbitrap machines or Q-Exactives, you now cleanly baseline, more than baseline resolve these species, and can determine the accurate masses of each one of these components. So in complex mixtures like you know, cell lysates 
uh, biofluids, et cetera, you want to use instrumentation that has both high mass accuracy as well as high resolution. And this is just the Surgeon General from years ago warning you that insufficient mass accuracy is dangerous to your health. Remember, anybody remember his name? Somebody say Coop? That's the Coop. That's right. See ever at Coop. <clears throat> the guy that was responsible, I think, for the warnings on cigarette packages. Uh, so Carl, I don't know, Carl, you don't have this slide in your deck, do you? Okay, so uh, this just shows you that, that uh, accurate mass really is a, is a, as it says, a powerful constraint when you're searching peptide mass information against a database. So uh, this is a peptide of mass 1005. This shows you increasing mass accuracy in part per million on the measurement of that peptide. And this shows you the number of possible amino acid compositions independent of what actually exists in the database. This is just the number of possibilities. And you'll notice that, gee, you know, going from what is already pretty high resolution, sub 10 part per million, to one part per million, yeah, that, that constrains the number of amino acid compositions, but gee, not by a whole lot. And you're going from you know, 4,000 down to 300. And it's a constraint, but you still have 300 things you'd have to figure out. Um, now, but when you're talking about searching a database, so let's say this is a mammalian cell lysate, now that represents two levels of constraint, the accurate mass and secondly, what is known to exist in nature in uh, the mammalian genome. And so now, at one part per million, you have only 18 potential triptych peptides. So while you have 300 potential amino acid compositions, there's only 18 actual triptych peptides that, that have that composition, and you can then begin to work out, well, which one of these is it likely to be? And of course, how you do that is using your MS, MS data that we've generated as part of that same experiment. Okay. Um, how are we doing for time? I don't have a watch on. And do we have a quick read? Quarter to one, okay, so I'm almost, almost done. Most analyses uh, in proteomics are done by digestion of peptides to proteins, and this is referred to as bottom-up proteomics. Uh, it has, uh, and this is what you're gonna be hearing about throughout the course of the day. Uh, it has a number of advantages listed here. The data acquisition is very highly automated now, and Carl will be talking about that. Importantly, the reason why this is done is that the fragmentation of triptych peptides, i.e. taking a protein, digesting it with trypsin, has been studied now for several decades. And it's really very well understood, and the rules of fragmentation are what underlie the software tools that are used for automated data analysis. Um, fourth, but also very importantly, is that it's much easier to get high resolution separations of peptides than it is to separate proteins, okay? A lot of proteins are very sticky, you never get them off the column. It's much easier after you've digested them to be able to separate these complex mixtures of peptides. Now that said, there's a lot of disadvantages as well. The biggest one being that you've taken what was already a very complex mixture and now you've magnified its complexity by however many triptych peptides each individual protein can generate. So using roughly estimating 20 to 100 times more complex, and this puts, this puts a very high analytical demand on the instrument to be able to make measurements of lots and lots of peptides that are in your mixture. Um, fortunately, those instruments that I showed you have gotten increasingly fast over time, maintaining their sensitivity, and that's just over the last couple of years. So we see uh, really a continual arithmetic improvement in the performance of mass spectrometers over the next three to five years. And every three to five years by history in mass spectrometry, there's been a leap in terms of a new analyzer that's been introduced. So I, I, you know, the, one, the one thing I would never do is discount that there could be factors of 10 improvement in what we do. Okay, moving on. Uh, you can also, just to make sure you're aware of this, you can, in fact, do something called top-down proteomics. And what this means is taking an intact protein and analyzing it directly, not just for molecular weight information, but to try to derive information about the sequence of that protein. And uh, this is most useful for relatively simple mixtures or single proteins, and it has the advantage that if you have variants that 
are isoforms or which have multiple modifications on them representing some kind of a code, like in the case of histones, for example, you can read out in one go on, a, on effectively one population of the molecules what the, uh, what the uh, arrangement or the combinatorial modifications are that are present on that population. You can't do that once you've digested the protein to peptides. Now, and, and there's a couple of references here if you're interested in that. But while it's useful, it, it requires really quite specialized instrumentation. You can't easily apply this to complex mixtures. The data interpretation uh, remains, despite advances that have been made relatively recently, quite complex. And the breadth and depth of coverage is nowhere near what you can do with um, bottom-up uh, proteomics. You get maybe a few hundred proteins able to be detected in these studies, not the thousands, uh, even tens of thousands, that you can do now by modern proteomics. Uh, so uh, we have to do some sample handling. So this is uh, really a preamble to what you're going to be hearing from Monica later. The first thing we do is to reduce and alkylate the proteins. And the reason for doing this is to break disulfide bonds um, and make, them, make the protein more amenable to digestion. Uh, Then we use highly specific proteases. I've talked a lot about trypsin, but we also use things like Lyce, <coughs> Staph V8, and Ospen, and their specificities are shown here. But occasionally, we'll, because there's a need to, I, to, to look at a certain part of a specific protein, we'll resort to less specific proteases like chymotrypsin, proteinase K, or thermolysin in order to get to that part of the molecule. But it's not our first recourse. We tend to stick to the more highly specific proteases Lyce and trypsin in particular. There are some problematic amino acids, so you should just be aware of this. Methionine, uh, no matter what you do, is pretty easy to oxidize. So uh, we observe it plus 16 uh, in not all, but many, many of the peptides that contain methionine. Uh, if in the process of cutting up a protein, you generate uh, a glutamine or a carboxymetomethyl cysteine at the end terminus of your peptide, those will cyclize. These are just things, and these are uh, factors that now are actually incorporated into the automated interpretation algorithms and taken into account, but you should be aware of them. One thing that we, we try to avoid, although we do use urea as a denaturant, extended exposure to urea causes carbamylation of uh, the N termini of proteins and peptides, so we try to avoid this. Okay, so this is the experiment you're going to be hearing about repeatedly, biological samples down to uh, we're taking out mixtures of proteins, which are digested to peptides, separated and analyzed by LC, MS, MS on modern mass spectrometers to generate rich patterns of mass to charge and intensity of the peptides and fragment information for sequence. That data feeds into a data analysis package, uh, which Carl will be talking about in a moment, uh, which leads to peptide identity, protein identity, and information about relative abundance. And I'm just going to skip over these because they're redundant. And I'll finish with this slide, just to point out for those people who do a lot more uh, genomics or microarray work than they've done proteomics, um, there are some pretty distinct differences between what you do in the microarray or genomics area and proteomics. In microarrays, you know the features that you've put down on the chip. Uh, in mass spectrometry, we don't know all the features that we're likely to detect because we observe, for example, the modifications. And those are not things that are sometimes predictable uh, as to whether we'll see them or not. Your sample in a transcriptional profiling experiment is static during the analysis, where in our case, the sample is dynamic. It's coming off that liquid chromatography column in time. And we have to be fast enough to be able to sample whatever's coming off at any given moment in time from that, uh, from that chromatographic system. In transcript profiling space, you measure all the features. But in mass spectrometry, interestingly enough, we only get to something like today 25, maybe 50 percent of all the peptides actually uh, attempted to be sequenced. And of those, a smaller percentage are then sequenced by the automated analysis software. So there's a drop off in information here. And this is one of the places where there's going to, you will see substantial improvements as the instruments get faster and resolution and so forth improve. Um, you guys have a way of, of uh, or genomics guys have a way of uh, amplifying their, 
uh, low, low signals. We have no such amplification method in proteomics. And in any of our systems, whether it's a mammalian cell line or a biofluid, there's a tremendous dynamic range in the protein abundance. We have to be able to deal with that dynamic range directly. So it's a complication, analytical challenge. And here in, in transcript profiling space, if you don't see a signal, it means that thing isn't there, okay? Whereas in mass spectrometry, particularly in the case of discovery experiments, if you don't detect a species that you're interested in, it means either that it's not present or your sampling wasn't efficient enough to pick it up in that experiment. And you can't tell which. This is one of the reasons we have worked on developing and now implementing something called targeted mass spectrometry. You're going to be hearing about that today. So here are some suggested readings at the end of your um, uh, present, end of the presentation. I'm going to stop there, take any questions, um, and then hand it over to Carl. Anybody? You're all awake. That's good. Yes. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very good point. It's an important point. Not only are, pet, are some proteins ionized more efficiently because they have more chargeable sites on them, which, leads to, which relates directly to their detectability, but peptides also have large differences. And it's something which, now that you've mentioned it, I need to actually fold back into the presentation. Um, when you, even if you've got equivalent digestion of all peptides from a protein, they don't all respond the same. They don't have all the same signal response, even if you've got stoichiometric yield of all the peptides. Now, what contributes to this is, in, in some cases, yes, the degree of chargeability, but it's not just that. Some of it relates to hydrophobicity. More hydrophobic peptides, in some cases, tend to actually give you a stronger response. Part of this relates to how easy is it to desolvate, to take the water molecules away from, this, from, from the peptide. So there's a lot of factors, not all of which are well understood, but the, the, the practical uh, observation is that you can have 10 and sometimes even up to 100-fold difference in the abundance of a peptide, the observed height intensity of a peptide from the same protein, even with equivalent release efficiency. So again, this represents a challenge. So direct quantification from a mass spectrometry doesn't work unless you uh, have some kind of normalization or internal standard. And we're going to come back to that because it relates directly to talks you're going to be hearing about from Jake Jaffe and others this morning. Does that apply to intact maps as well? I'm sorry. Is it... Does that apply to intact maps? Intact peptides. Yes. So that, that's exactly what I'm referring to, not just fragmentation. I'm talking about the peptide precursor intensity is one-tenth to one one-hundredth of another peptide from the same protein. What about a full protein? Full proteins, you know, I don't, you know, they're, I could wave my hands and give you a, a solid answer, but I don't have the data to support this, but it, it's clear that with a, even a simple mixture of proteins, they give quite different um, ratios uh, with what you think is uh, uh, equivalent amounts. So because we don't measure pro a lot of mixtures of proteins any longer, most of what I'm telling you relates to peptides, and it's very true for peptides. Yes? Uh, is the resolution a fixed number for the instrument? It's not obvious on the top of my head as to why you know, the mass over the fixed would have maximum be a fixed number for a given Yeah, so um, the, the resolutions on the instruments that we're typically running now, just to give you a sense, is not 1,000, but more like 15,000 to even 100,000. That's the kind of resolution. And in terms of the, um, the uh, I'm not sure that, I think on a, on a quadrupole, um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, on a triple quad, I think the, the resolution actually is constant across the, the mass range, whereas on, um, you know, instruments like uh, these ion cyclotron resonance or orbitrap instruments, it's not. The resolution has to actually be specified at a given mass. Uh, typically, it's like a mass 400, you get 100,000 resolution. But if you're at mass 1,000, the resolution drops down. 